Hello and welcome to the Fringe Topics channel. Today, we delve into a baffling mystery that continues to be a subject of interest and speculation among those who study unsolved crimes and mysteries. It's the story of the Circleville letter writer. This is a notorious case involving an anonymous person or persons who sent threatening and provocative letters to residents of Circleville, Ohio and the surrounding areas from 1976 to the early 1990s. Secrets about nearly everyone in the community were divulged, but the identity of the letter writer or writers remains unknown to this day. The exact number of letters sent remains uncertain, as many were discarded by the recipients out of fear or frustration. It's estimated that over a thousand letters might have been dispatched during the Circleville Letter Writers Campaign. Every Circleville letter was postmarked from Columbus, Ohio, situated about 25 miles north of Circleville. The letters were handwritten, showcasing various styles and methods. This led some to speculate the possibility of multiple writers. The letters showed a deep knowledge of the recipient's personal lives and activities. Where did this intimate knowledge stem from? The community used party lines until the mid-1980s which meant that other people could eavesdrop on conversations. Would individuals be so careless as to discuss sensitive matters that could drastically affect their lives, the way these letters did for many? Perhaps things overheard triggered gossip, or maybe the gossips didn't concern themselves with what might be picked up on the phone line. The letter's content was highly provocative. They often accused individuals of infidelity, deceit, scandalous behavior, and even murder. Some letters contained threats, instigating increased fear and anxiety in the community of about 12,000 residents. The letter writer appeared to target individuals indiscriminately, without any discernible pattern, reason, or logic. While the threats and accusations were pointed and severe, they seemingly had no purpose other than to inflict emotional distress. The absence of an evident motive only deepens the enigma. The saga began in 1976, when someone referred to as the writer dispatched letters laden with threats of violence and hints of blackmail. This writer wanted votes to go to a preferred candidate in the county election. The letter reads, Pleased, let's keep writer happy. You have been watched, failure to comply, and you shall suffer. No one can help, no one can protect you. Obey. Get Mr. Massey elected to some type of office, or you will surely pay in the town of Circleville shall too. It's on you. The letter is signed simply, Writer. After several months of silence from the writer, anonymous letters began flooding the community in March of 1977. Residents lived in trepidation, unsure if their mailbox contained a cruel truth or baseless rumor about them. These malevolent messages ruptured friendships, broke families apart, and cast a shadow of doubt over everyone. The police, perplexed by the sender's concealed identity, grappled with a lack of leads. Due to the sensitive nature of the letters, the details of many letters were not disclosed. This case had such a crushing impact on the recipients and the community that some recipients chose not to disclose the full contents of the letters for privacy reasons or out of fear of drawing further attention to themselves. Although many residents received letters from the Circleville letter writer, the story is focused around several families that were drastically affected. These particular letters were mailed in March of 1977 that targeted an affair and made accusations of infidelity. There were four people specifically targeted, Ron and Mary Gillespie, Tracy Gillespie, Gordon Massey, and the sheriff. Mr. Massey was the Westfall School Superintendent. He married Clara May Clagg in 1952. Clara was an elementary school teacher in the Westfall School District. They had one son, William Massey, who was born in 1957. He would have been 18 or 19 in 1976. Gordon and Clara had their share of problems. Clara filed for divorce after William graduated. She cited alleged gross neglect of duty and extreme cruelty. The Masseys reconciled and dismissed the divorce in November 1976. On March 2, 1977, 
the first anonymous letter arrived at Westfall High School. It was addressed to the school superintendent, Gordon Massey. It had been written in a small, cramped print using upper and lower case. It accused Massey of sexually harassing bus drivers and of having an affair with a married school bus driver in Circleville. The letter reads, According to my girlfriend, you have asked her to go out many times and have asked the other female bus drivers too. This must stop at once for the good of the school and families. If they are not stopped, I will be forced to write to the school board, and I would hate to do that. To prey on another man's girl is untouchable. I suggest you find yourself a pimple-faced whore and start up with her and leave my girls alone. Ryder told Massey to confess his affairs, or he would go to the school board. When he didn't, more letters came and some with threats. One letter stated that his brake lines would be cut if he didn't stop sleeping with his employees. The school board received letters telling of Massey's affairs with the bus drivers and demanded he be fired. Massey denied everything and was not fired as the writer demanded. After all, there was no proof of any wrongdoing. March 18, 1977. After waiting a few weeks and seeing that the demands weren't met, the writer sends a letter to the school's vice principal. This one tells of Massey's alleged affairs and how proof would be sent. The writer used an employee's identification, number 62,971, which was that of Mary Gillespie. The only portion of the letter we could find reads, Talk to Gordon Massey about his affair. I shall warn you, I know the truth. I want to protect your school. It has a good reputation. You should keep it like that. I shall send you proof about driver number X. She has a child in school there now. I shall prove this shortly. I expect him to be discharged. You'll see that I am telling the truth. Vaughn and Mary Gillespie were high school sweethearts and were married not long after Mary had graduated in 1961. They had one son, Eric born in 1963 and one daughter, Tracy born in 1970. Ron was an Elk Lodge member and the couple was well liked in the community. On March 21st, 1977, another anonymous letter arrives on Brooks Miller Road in an isolated rural area postmarked from Columbus, Ohio. This was Ron and Mary's home. The letter was addressed to Mary. It was handwritten in a distinctive block letter style and accused Mary of having an affair with Gordon Massey, the superintendent of schools. The letter writer demanded she stay away from Massey and leaves an open threat telling her that her house is being watched and that she has children and that this is not a joke. It also informed her that notification of this affair has been sent out to those concerned. Mrs. Gillespie, stay away from Massey. Don't lie when questioned about meeting him. I know where you live. I've been observing your house and know you have children. This is no joke. Please take it serious. Everyone concerned has been notified and everything will be over soon. Then on March 29, 1977, she gets another letter. Call the sheriff. He can't watch you forever. Stay away from him noon as well as night. If I can't get you together and you make a fool of me such as the school has done, I shall come out there and put a bullet in that little girl's head. Too many think this is a joke. We'll see in time. I know where you live. I've been watching your house. The threatening letters kept arriving. She received the third letter, April 5, 1977. This is your last chance to report him. I know you are a pig and will prove it and shame you out of Ohio. A pig sneaks around and meets other women's husbands behind their backs, only causes families, homes and marriages to suffer. You are such a pig and I will prove it. Why doesn't he come to your rescue? Or has he too much to lose in his wife, which pigs like you take advantage of? His $28,500 a year job or his kickbacks? How's your little girl? Will she grow up to be like you? Mary failed to tell her husband about the letters, so the writer decides he should tell Ron about Mary and Gordon Massey. Now, her husband Ron started receiving letters from the writer. The first letter arrives April 9, 1977. This letter reads, We must inform you that your wife is having an affair with Mr. Massey. She has chased him until he caught her. 
eliminate them both before they eliminate you. Remember, we know where you work and know your red and white truck. No one can help you. Think of your children and their future. Call the school board and report the truth after you finish your investigation. Notify the school board immediately. Again, your life is in danger. Having read the letter, Ron confronts Mary about the affair. Mary denied having an affair and showed him the letters she got from the writer. Neither one of them know quite what to do about the letters. A few days later, Ron receives a second letter. You're doing a lot for her. No one cares that much for anyone this day. Make him come to a rescue, but he won't. He's being awful good lately. He knows what he must do, but he won't. Make her admit the truth. Call the school board. His affairs must stop. Everyone will know soon. Think of yourself. Ron's third letter is received April 14th, 1977. You have had two weeks and done nothing. You are a pig defender. You are also a pig. Make her admit the tryst and inform the school board. If not, I will broadcast it on posters, signs, billboards until the truth comes out. Only pigs ride motorcycles. Good hunting in your red and white truck on your way to work. Ron, out of complete frustration and knowing that his brother-in-law had once been a prison guard decided to involve him and his wife, Ron's sister, Karen Sue, in this perplexing situation. After all, they were family and were all close. Ron's brother-in-law, Paul Larry Freshour, had married Ron's sister, Karen Sue Gillespie, in October of 1962. Paul worked as a quality control inspector at the Anheuser-Busch plant in Columbus. Karen worked at a non-profit organization involved in horse racing, the United States Trotting Association. The company was headquartered in Columbus where she worked in financing. After Paul and Karen arrive at the Gillespie's home, they informed them as to what was happening. Not only were they getting threatening letters, but posters were being erected along Mary's bus route. Ron informed them that he was leaving earlier in the morning so that he could remove them before the students, his children, and passers-by saw them. As the letter writer stated, he was hunting them on his way to work. Mary and Ron shared with them that Mary believed she had identified the person penning the letters. She mentioned a co-worker named David Longberry who also worked as a school bus driver. He had made multiple romantic advances towards Mary, all of which she declined, leading to his bitterness towards her. Ron and Mary asked Paul to write a few letters to him and let him know that they knew it was him. The letters stopped for a while. Everything seemed quiet. Was this because it truly was David Longberry or was it just a coincidence? Did the true writer have knowledge of the letters and decide David Longberry would make a good scapegoat? The alleged affair became the talk of Circleville. The writer understood the power of gossip. Mary and Karen Sue had planned a trip to Florida. As fate would have it, they embarked on their journey to Florida on August 19, 1977, the day a tragic event unfolded back at their home. Tracy, who was only eight years old at the time, informed the authorities that her father had been at home and on the phone until around 10 p.m. Despite both of his children being at home, he left. Tracy recounted that he retrieved his gun, kissed her goodbye, and assured her he would return later. This left both Tracy and her 15-year-old brother, Eric, alone in the house for the night. The events surrounding the mysterious phone call remain unclear. Tragically, Ron was in a fatal accident shortly after leaving the house. His truck veered off the road near an intersection at Five Points Pike and Darby Turnpike, crashing into a tree. He was pronounced dead at 10.25 p.m. due to severe head and torso injuries. Sadly, he hadn't been wearing his seatbelt. The police investigated the crash scene and the coroner ruled it an accident as he was found to be intoxicated. The blood chemistry report was performed by a pathologist at Brown Laboratories in Columbus, Ohio, and indicated he was legally intoxicated. With a blood alcohol of 0.16%, Ron's judgment coordination and reaction time would have been significantly impaired. It was mentioned that the gun he took with him had been discharged. A bullet had been fired from it, though this could have occurred a week, a month, or even longer ago.
Sheriff Dwight E. Radcliffe was the one who identified Ron's body. On the official identification form, where one typically notes their relationship to the deceased, the sheriff simply wrote, friend. He then personally traveled to Ron Gillespie's parents' home in Mullenberg Township to deliver the tragic news of their son's passing. Paul Freshour, Ron's brother-in-law, was convinced that Ron had been murdered. This suspicion aligned with the narrative the Circleville writer aimed to propagate. The writer started distributing letters to the locals, urging a more in-depth investigation into Ron's demise. Following Ron's death, the mysterious Circleville letters resurfaced. Six years of harassment and unsettling letters to the community and Mary seemed unending. The letters didn't only target Mary, elected officials also found themselves in the crosshairs. Among them, Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe became a prominent target. The Circleville writer was fervently attempting to tarnish the reputation of the sheriff. Concurrently, Paul Freshour pointed fingers at the sheriff for alleged negligence in investigating Ron's case, firmly believing that Ron had been murdered. Paul accused the sheriff of corruption, emphasizing the sheriff's apparent animosity towards him. In an interview, Paul claimed to be more informed and better connected than the police, expressing surprise that he was never questioned about his knowledge regarding Ron. Amidst mounting pressure, Mary confessed to having an affair with Gordon Massey. Did she? However, she was adamant that the relationship began only after her husband, Ron, had passed away. Despite the revelation, Mary retained her job but soon found herself at the center of town gossip once more. In 1979, after 26 years of marriage, Gordon Massey and Clara decided to part ways through a divorce. Their son, William Massey, was 22 years old at that time. In 1982, Paul and Karen Sue's marriage came to a tumultuous end. Karen claimed that Paul was physically violent and had a quick temper. In contrast, Paul alleged that Karen was unfaithful and ensured she left the marriage without any assets, including custody of their daughters. At this juncture, their son, age 19, opted to stay with Karen. The daughters, aged 12 and 15, might not have been given a choice. Karen Sue relocated to the house on her property, which was previously inhabited by her and Ron's parents. Six years had passed since Ron's demise, and the enigmatic writer had momentarily ceased sending letters. Mary was involved with Gordon Massey, though the duration of their relationship remains unclear. By 1983, Mary's 13-year-old daughter, Tracy, along with Mary, became the focus of the Circleville writer's harassment. On February 7, 1983, while on her bus route to collect students, Mary spotted a derogatory sign about her daughter. Stopping to remove it, she discovered it was connected to a small box, affixed to a wooden post. A string linked a gun's trigger to the post, indicating that if Mary had forcefully taken down the sign, the gun might have fired at her. She cautiously detached the box, ensuring it was out of the children's reach, and resumed her route. After completing her rounds, she inspected the box in her driveway. Recognizing the threat, she immediately reported it to the sheriff's office. During the investigation, it was discovered that the gun belonged to Paul Freshour. Attempts had been made to file off the gun's serial number, but they were unsuccessful. When questioned about the weapon, Paul told the sheriff that it had gone missing, but he hadn't deemed it necessary to report. On February 25, 1983, Paul was asked to undergo a polygraph test. He denied any involvement in placing the gun in the box and claimed to have no knowledge of the incident. He also refuted having written or sent any of the anonymous letters being investigated. The test results indicated deception in his responses. Upon further questioning, Paul admitted to penning around 40 to 50 of the letters under scrutiny, but continued to deny any involvement or prior knowledge of the gun-related incident. Ron and Mary had only requested Paul to write a handful of letters to Longberry, certainly not 40 or 50. So, who were the recipients of all the other letters? On March 2nd, 1983, Mary was asked to undergo a polygraph test. She was questioned about her involvement in the anonymous letters and whether she had placed the gun in the box she handed over to the sheriff's office. Mary successfully passed the examination. 
The sheriff conducted interviews with numerous suspects and witnesses. Among them were Kenneth Reed and David Longberry. Kenneth Reed supervised the school bus drivers within the school district. However, both Reed and Longberry were eventually cleared of suspicion. A colleague of Karen Sue Freshour reported that in 1983, signs were being posted in their workplace parking lot, accusing Karen Sue of being a lesbian. He mentioned that he had removed many of these signs and stored them in his car trunk before Karen Sue arrived for work. After evaluating all the evidence, the sheriff arrested Paul Freshour. He was indicted by a grand jury in March 1983 and scheduled for trial in October of the same year. Throughout, Paul consistently denied orchestrating the letter campaign. After securing his release on a $50,000 bond, Paul Freshour voluntarily admitted himself to the mental health center at Riverside Hospital. It's unclear whether this was a strategic move to potentially plead not guilty by reason of insanity or if the weight of the accusations had genuinely affected his mental well-being. Regardless, this defense was not employed during his trial. On October 24, 1983, Paul Freshour faced trial for the attempted murder of his sister-in-law, Mary Gillespie. The trial spanned just a week. Although Paul was never formally charged with writing the letters, 39 of them were admitted as evidence against him. The prosecution argued that the writing on these letters bore striking similarities to the writing found on the booby trap. A handwriting expert confirmed that Paul Freshor had penned the letters, identifying a match with his handwriting on 391 letters and 103 postcards. Additionally, Paul's employer testified that Paul was absent from work the day Mary discovered the dangerous trap. After a mere two and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found Paul Freshour guilty of attempted murder. He received the maximum sentence seven to 25 years. After Paul Freshour's incarceration, his ex-wife, Karen Sue, gained custody of their daughters, as well as ownership of their house and any pension benefits. This turn of events led to speculation about Karen Sue's possible involvement in framing her ex-husband. Could her resentment from the divorce have driven her to implicate him, even if it meant endangering Mary Gillespie? Interestingly, a colleague of Mary's reported seeing a yellow El Camino parked near the location of the booby trap just 20 minutes before Mary came across it. A tall man with sandy hair was spotted near the vehicle, seemingly attending to personal needs. Despite this lead being present in the sheriff's records, there's no documented evidence indicating any follow-up. However, rumors circulated that Karen Sue's brother owned a yellow El Camino, a detail later verified by the show Unsolved Mysteries. In his closing statement, Paul Freshour's attorney alluded to Karen Sue's potential motives. He asked, who harbored enough animosity towards Paul to implicate him? If you examine the divorce decree, who stands to benefit financially if Paul is found guilty and incarcerated? While Paul's imprisonment might seem like the end of the story, it was far from over. Even as he served his sentence, and notably during periods in solitary confinement, the letters continued to circulate within the community. Some of these letters bore Paul's fingerprints. However, once it was confirmed that he couldn't have possibly dispatched them from his confinement, it became evident that he had an accomplice. Given the time he had while out on bail, he could have pre-written numerous letters, ensuring they carried his fingerprints to sow doubt and fuel speculation. The lingering question remained, who could have been his accomplice? While incarcerated, Paul received a letter allegedly from the Circleville writer claiming that he had been framed and would not be released. Subsequent letters emerged, making serious allegations against the prosecutor in Paul's trial, Roger Klein and Dr. Ray Carroll, a family physician and the Pickaway County coroner, regarding their immoral behavior. The TV show Unsolved Mysteries planned a segment on the Circleville writer. In December 1993, the show received a postcard warning them against coming to Ohio, Despite the warning, the crew proceeded, and no incidents occurred. Was this an attempt by the Circleville writer to gain more publicity? Paul Freshour served ten and a half years of his sentence and was released on parole in 1994. Oddly enough, when he was released, the letters stopped being mailed to the community. 
Did Paul have an accomplice who stopped sending the letters? Who was this accomplice? Or was Paul truly a victim? These are unanswered questions that remain a mystery. Even when the letters ceased, the community's fears were not alleviated. A menacing sign appeared in the heart of Circleville, warning that someone was watching and waiting. How many people were involved in the Circleville letters? Did individuals in the community with grievances take advantage of the writer? There are numerous theories, suspects, and victims in the widely publicized case of the Circleville letters. Paul maintained his innocence until his death from a heart attack on June 28, 2012. Karen Sue, Paul's ex-wife, had married John Frank Sorek. She separated from him before his death in 2008. While she stood to benefit the most from Paul's incarceration, it raises questions about the true cost. Both she and her son had access to Paul's gun. As of August 2023, Karen Sue is 77 years old and resides in Columbus, Ohio. Mark Freshour, the son of Paul and Karen, was only 39 when he died by suicide on September 12, 2002. His mother, Karen, mentioned that he had struggled with depression for many years. It's uncertain if Mark was responsible for taking the gun and whether his father chose not to come forward to shield him. There's speculation about whether Mark used the gun at his mother's behest to frame his father. After all, they had a strained relationship and Mark never visited his father in prison. Don Michelle Freshour, the daughter of Paul and Karen Sue, will be 55 years old in October 2023 and resides in Columbus, Ohio. Helen Freshour, another daughter of Paul and Karen Sue, was 53 years old as of January 2023 and resides in Grove City, Ohio. Mary Gillespie, she allegedly had an affair with Gordon Massey, though the start date is uncertain. Was she involved in the letter writing or the booby trap, or was she merely a victim? She denied the affair to her husband, but after his passing, she began an affair with Gordon Massey. The duration of this affair is unknown, but she eventually married Ronald Dale Haynes. She divorced him before his death in 2017. In his obituary, she is mentioned as his former wife. Ronald Gillespie suffered the greatest loss, his life. Did the stress from the letters and accusations cause him to drink and contribute to his accident, or was he murdered as Paul suggested? Eric Randolph Gillespie, the son of Ron and Mary, as of 2023, is 60 years old and resides in Circleville, Ohio. Tracy Gillespie, the daughter of Ron and Mary, is married and resides in Mount Sterling, Ohio. Gordon Ray Massey, despite the publicity and trial, stayed out of the limelight. He passed away on June 18, 1996, at the age of 63. Clara Clagg Massey, Gordon Massey's wife, finalized their divorce in 1979. She later married Alan Blair and remained married to him until her passing on May 28, 2021, at the age of 87. William Massey, the son of Gordon and Clara Clagg Massey, faced the turmoil of his parents' divorce. Did he blame his father's infidelity for the divorce? Did he seek revenge by jeopardizing his father's job, or was he merely an innocent victim? William Massey passed away on August 9, 2023. Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe served as the Sheriff of Pickaway County from 1965 until his retirement in 2013. Holding the position for 12 consecutive terms, 48 years, he became the longest-serving sheriff in the United States. He passed away on May 6, 2020. Dr. Ray Carroll, a respected Pickaway County coroner, performed Ron's autopsy. He later received letters making serious allegations against him. After an investigation based on these letters, in December 1993, he was presented with multiple charges. Dr. Carroll passed away in 2007 at the age of 86 without facing any legal consequences related to these claims. Subsequent investigations confirmed the accuracy of the allegations mentioned in the letters. Roger Klein, who was the prosecutor in Paul's case, who the writer alleged had an affair with a school teacher named Vicki Koch. When she became pregnant, she was purportedly murdered to safeguard his life and career. Upon investigation, half of this claim was confirmed. Roger had an affair with Vicky and was the father of her unborn child. Vicky Coach went missing in August 1980, and her remains were discovered in Madison County, Ohio, in September 1980. Her murder remains unsolved. The Circleville letter writer case is still an open mystery. 
Although the town has progressed, the wounds inflicted by the letters persist in shaping its collective memory. These letters exemplify the damage that faceless cruelty can cause and stand as a grim reminder of the repercussions of lingering enigmas. The shadow of the Circleville letter writer endures, indelibly marking the town's history. We're eager to hear your perspectives on the events in Circleville. Please share your insights in the comments. I hope you enjoyed the story of the Circleville letter writer. For more intriguing tales and unsolved mysteries, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Your support really does mean a lot to us. Join me next time as we unravel another chapter of the unknown. Thank you for watching and stay safe. Goodbye for now.